Hi, everybody. We're glad you're here. Tim Anderson, the appraiser's advocate, and we're here today with our friend Craig Morley. Now, everybody knows who Craig is, but we're going to go over it again anyway for legal purposes. Uh, Craig is a sitting member of the Appraisal Standards Board, but he's not here today in that capacity. Craig is the former chair of NAR's appraisal section, but he is not here in that capacity. Uh, Craig is a, a, a president ex officio of the National Association of Appraisers, but he is not here in that capacity. And he is a former member of, a former chair of, and currently serves as a consultant to the Utah uh, State Board, but he is uh, not here in that capacity. And he's Debbie's husband, but he's not here in that capacity either. He's just here as Craig, our friend, someone who is passionate about real estate appraisal and who has a deep knowledge of what's going on. So Craig, welcome. It's good to be with you again. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. It's always a pleasure to be with you and to talk about some of the appraisal related issues. So thank you. Well, Craig, again, just so everybody knows, we've talked, we've spoken offline about a couple of things. And today in this podcast, let's cover two areas. Let's cover what's happening uh, in the market currently. And then let's talk a little bit about the AARO, the uh, uh, Association of Appraisal Regulatory Officials meeting, a uh, series of meetings that uh, took place in the first part of October of 2022 and what that uh, portends for us, what, uh, how, how that uh, applies to the future of real estate appraisal, et cetera. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, from a standpoint of, uh, I don't know, the last time we spoke was about three months ago. Uh, what has happened in the market and what are some of the ramifications of what has happened in the market? Well, yeah. yeah. We had seen such rapid increases in prices over time. You, you, you pretty well, from past history, you know that uh, those kinds of trends just can't continue uh, on, on an indefinite basis. And uh, with the increase in inflation, uh, you've got the Fed using monetary policy trying to slow down inflation by increasing interest rates. And uh, those rates have probably increased at as fast of rate as it ever, ever has in the past, maybe faster. It gone to where your 30-year fixed mortgage rate was down or close to 3%. And within a very short period of time, it's uh, put rates up uh, at over 6%. And the, the net effect of that is that... Uh, you know, many segments around the market had seen property prices increase as much as 20, 25 percent on an annual basis in 2021 coming into 2022. And uh, the, the increase in the interest rates have put the brakes on on uh, sales transactions. I think in many markets, we're seeing declines of 20, 30, 40 percent in, in terms of uh, sales activity. And, and for appraisers performing appraisals on refinances, that's a, a dramatic drop off on that kind of, uh, of lending activity. And so some of the lenders we're talking to have seen their, their, their business drop by 50, 60, 70% in some cases, uh, depending on the model that they had uh, devised to, you know, perform, what, what kind of loans they were going to originate. And I think appraisers have likewise seen similar declines where uh, the number of new orders for uh, loan origination have dropped dramatically. Uh, we've seen in our office about a 40% decline in, in work activity. I hear from time to time appraisers who are happy to get a couple of appraisals a week, whereas they, you know, in times past, they were doing significantly more than that. And so, the, the effect has been that, uh, that uh, the demand for appraisal services have, have declined, and it seems that the GSEs continually or are continuing to use the waivers uh, to originate many of these loans that are, that are being made so that, uh, that uh, they aren't using appraisers on a more frequent basis because of availability of appraisers. 
And so it's it's going to it's going to be a little bit of a challenge for the next few months, I think, uh, as buyers and consumers uh, readjust to a new normal. Craig, let's talk a little bit about uh, these waivers, and then let's talk a little bit about um, uh, trainees. How what is happening is affecting trainees. Now, when appraisal waiver, and first of all, there have, all, there have always been appraisal waivers. Uh, lenders have always been willing to do that, but they have become, I don't know, more, I guess, more popular is the right term in the past, about well, three, three to five years. And uh, th uh, we were originally told a number of years ago at a conference, if I recall correctly, that appraisal waivers would never apply to any more than about 15%. Uh, of appraisals. And then uh, even then, the, they were at the discretion of the borrower, not the lender. And if the borrower said, no, I want an appraisal, the lender would say, no, fine, and we'll get you an appraisal. Just remember, you're having to pay for it. And it slows the process down. So, but we've seen an increase uh, in waivers. Now, let's look at it from not so much the standpoint of less business for us, but let's look at it from the standpoint of are consumers by electing this option uh, going to find themselves in three or four years in a position where uh, because they didn't get an appraisal and the they just paid the listing price or they just negotiated a price are they going to find themselves perhaps in a in a uh, underwater situation or a foreclosure situation and then is the appraisal really any guarantee that that wouldn't happen. Yeah, my, my sense is, Tim, as much as I would like to tell you that uh, getting the appraiser would be the insurance against that scenario playing out, I, I think the reality is that because markets are dynamic and prices change over time, uh, what the market looks like today is not going to be the same as what the market looks like tomorrow. And so I think that the, the problem we've had with the waivers is that uh, they've escalated the number of waivers to over 50% of many of the loan originations. And, and in some cases, especially on refinances where the GSEs have good data and the uh, prices have been going up and I'm borrowing 50, 60% of the total assessed value based on tax records or whatever modeling they're using, you, you have to question, does it make sense to, to, to go through that process? On a purchase, it's a little different situation. And, and I think the element that becomes maybe helpful in, in the lending process is that when the appraiser comes in and does a competent job of accurately reporting the quality and condition of the property, then, uh, the, the, then the lenders and the borrowers and everyone else have a better idea of what it is that is the collateral for the loan. And, and, and that's where we, we see some of that, uh, where if I get a waiver, I, I, I maybe have a less, uh, uh, an inferior view of what, what the collateral is for the loan. The, the problem I suspect that we have is that as appraisers, we haven't done a very good job of being consistent and uniform in the way that we aggregate and report the data. And so I know that the, you know, there's uh, frustrations on the part of the GSEs where because the GSEs will keep track of the quality and condition ratings that appraisers uh, put on properties that they use as comparable sales, there's a, you know, an all too frequent tendency for appraisers to use the same quality and condition ratings on every property so that they don't have to worry about being inconsistent with themselves. The, the, the downside of that logic and mentality is that uh, it reduces our value as uh, professionals in uh, not providing realistic, accurate uh, analysis of these things. It, 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 this is kind of a veer, veering off the, the, the general topic, but you know, I, I was uh, looking at a uh, condo down in uh, Las Vegas. It was a high-rise condo in a very nice area. I've seen a lot of stuff over time and I'm looking at this property having a very hard time seeing how you could spend more money on these units than what they've spent and they are in pristine condition and uh, looking through I see some 
you know, through some of these data share deals where the uh, other appraisers have reported this as average quality, average condition. And, and I just look at that and think, you know, we're not doing ourselves any favors. You know, is it average relative to the other units in the project? Yes. Is the condition average relative to everything else in the project? Yes. But the GSEs aren't wanting that. They want an absolute, how does this fit in the broader definitional context of what we're providing? And, and appraisers oftentimes don't do that. And so our value in the lending process gets diminished because we aren't accurately reporting what things really are in, in absolute terms. And so the modeling that the, the GSEs use, you know, is, is oftentimes not that much worse than if, if we're doing it. And so in order for us to maintain relevance in the valuation space, we really need to do a better job on how we, uh, on, on, on how we do this. So basically, uh, Craig, if I understand what you're saying, is um, appraisers, either the GSEs need to redefine uh, uh, C1 through C6, or uh, appraisers need to uh, be a lot more familiar with those definitions and then adhere to them uh, in describing the property. Is that correct? That That's it. I think the tendency is that because what once the GSE said, we're going to send you a little note telling you that last time you said this was a good quality home. Now you're saying it's average. Uh, why? Wh what changed? And so appraisers say, well, gee, if you're going to do that, I'm just going to rate everything the same. And I've talked to people who've attended classes where the instructor has suggested that, which seems like really poor advice. But the the other thing, and this this is new information. I I do sit on a uh, advisory board <clears throat> where we're able to see some of the things that are going on with the GSEs on some of the new modernization. And uh, they're going to become a little better in providing more options for appraisers in uh, being able to report quality and condition. It will be segregated so that you can provide the exterior. You know, I, I can have an average quality exterior, but a pretty good quality interior or I could have the exterior of the house in good condition and the outside in average condition. And uh, with some of the changes that are coming along, those options will become more readily available. So if we will take the opportunity to do a better job in reporting the actual quality and condition of the interior and the exterior, it will provide for perhaps better analysis. We're still waiting to see what that's going to look like in, in actual practice, but uh, that is the direction that uh, they're trying to go, which I think will be a step in the right direction. Okay. Um, as we talk about this, as we talk about the fact that uh, the GSEs are not entirely happy with the uh, way we've uh, described units, and given what you said about the instructors who are just saying, well, yeah, just, you know, everything average, it makes things easier that way. Uh, let's talk about uh, this from the concept of trainees. Uh, number one, given the changes in the market, what are the, uh, oh, the possibilities of a, of a brand new uh, graduate of appraisal school getting a job? And then what are, what are the probabilities of the uh, appraiser's uh, supervisor properly training the appraiser. So five years down the road, the newly certified appraiser isn't up before the state board. You know, anytime you have a drop off in demand for the services, it's going to make it more difficult for the traditional uh, trainer, trainee uh, appraisal model to, to be effective. Because the reality is, is now, Trainers have time to train the trainee, but they don't have the work to keep them busy enough to feel like, well, gee, if I want to pay this person something, my revenue has now dropped by a significant amount. And even though I have the time, I don't have the financial resources to, uh, to engage in, in hiring someone to, to train. So I think it's going to become more challenging for uh, someone who wants to find a mentor or a supervising appraiser to do that. 
Now, that having been said, we know that uh, that there are several organizations that are expected to roll out the practical applications of real estate appraisal alternative experience credit programs later this year. And uh, there are some states that are developing their own system to get appraisers in underserved areas so that uh, they can so so that they can get their appraisal license uh, to to work in some of these areas. So there are still opportunities out there, but they're going to be more challenging to 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 find. And I think the other challenge that we're going to face is that uh, these Perea programs are going to cost money. And so, you know, unless you've got a little spare cash sitting around, it's going to, you, you know, you, you pay money to go to college. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with paying money to become trained to provide professional services as appraiser, but there will be some resources available. Uh, the Appraisal Foundation is going to be offering some scholarships, so I'm told. And I think there may be some options that uh, people will be able to get some of the financial help to to be able to get through some of these programs. But uh, it's it's not going to be easier, I don't believe, until we see things start to pick up in terms of uh, appraisal volume. I guess I better turn my microphone on. Okay, from a standpoint of the supervisor and the trainee, there may be some scholarship money available. So the appraiser gets out of the program, but then nobody's hiring because there isn't enough surplus cash uh, to pay somebody two or three or four or 500 bucks a week uh, during their uh, uh, training period. So trainees might be looking at a relatively dry period for the next six to 12 months. Is that correct? That's what it looks like. You know, I think one of the problems we've got right now is we have the media hyping the downward decline of the real estate market. You've got some people coming out and saying, oh man, this, this, this decline is gonna be worse than the last one. I, I personally don't see that happening, but uh, I, I, I think you've got, a rapid increase in interest rates with a rapid uh, uh, with, with uh, markets starting to exhibit some evidence of decline. And so I think as a buyer, if I'm looking to buy something, I've got two problems. One is I don't want to buy a house today that's going to be worth less tomorrow. And I might have a harder time qualifying for the loan uh, simply because the interest rates are much higher. And so I think all, all the evidence that we've seen is that uh, that uh, many buyers are sitting on the sidelines waiting to see what's going to happen, either waiting for prices to get down to a point that they can afford them or waiting to uh, see if interest rates are going to adjust or, or both. And there's some indication that, you know, some of that might begin to, to take place. The problem is the Fed keeps, you know, they, they don't seem to give enough time to allow the changes that they've made in their monetary policy to take complete effect. And, and so it, it's, there's a pretty high degree of uncertainty is what's going to happen. I think the thing we've seen on the seller's side of the market is that many sellers are thinking, gee, I think I missed my window for getting the most out of my property. Maybe I better sell it now while prices are higher than they're likely to be in the future. And so we've seen a huge increase. I, in many of the markets that uh, we're involved with, the listing inventory has gone up by a factor of four. And so you all of a sudden you, you see a decline in sales activity with an increase in the uh, listing inventory. And it's a perfect formula for prices to drop. And uh, we're beginning to see asking prices uh, lower than prices that property have sold for three or four months ago. And so we, we've got, you know, there, there is some indication we will see some market adjustments. I think the mitigating thing to keep in, you know, keep in context is that when you've seen a 20% increase in property prices uh, in, in a one-year period of time, a 20% 
decline just simply means that that will be about what prices were in the first quarter of 2021. So anybody who bought properties over the past year, you know, year, year and a half might be in trouble, but otherwise, you know, you, you won't have made the money you thought you did on paper, but it, it may not be as terrible as, uh, as, as we sometimes think it, uh, it might be or that it sounds. Okay, given the changes in the market, let's take a look at this from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, there are going to be a whole lot of consumers out there who are very bent out of shape that 18 months after paying $450,000 for their house because they bought it uh, on a, uh, you know, there were six people sitting in the living room, each of them bidding against the other one. And uh, the listing price was four ten, dollars and they paid four fifty dollars just to get the house. And no prices are no longer going up as they were going up. And listings are increasing, which means they've got a lot more competition. So the, the possibility exists that the, the poor appraiser is going to get caught in the middle. And when the appraiser comes along and says, uh, well, yeah, yeah, I know you paid $450,000 for your house. I got a copy of the deed, but it's not worth that much now. It's only worth $400,000. So all of a sudden, the appraiser, instead of being the uh, analyst who tells the lender what is happening in the market becomes the messenger with bad news who therefore deserves to be shot. Um, so I have two questions. Number one, are we going to see an increase in regulations against appraisers relative to this? And number two, in talking about the arrow meetings uh, that uh, just finished up uh, in the first week of October of 2022, did regulators uh, address this issue in any way? You know, I think the likelihood that people are going to be unhappy with the with the appraisal is is pretty good. You know, it 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 brings to mind uh, how a consumer is going to perceive uh, the desktop appraisal in this kind of environment. I mean, th th there is oftentimes a a perception that uh, if the appraiser comes out and looks at the property, you're going to get a more reliable result than if, you know, you've had somebody else either provide the data or they've done it from a desktop uh, platform. And so it might result in appraisers, you know, being more engaged in the uh, collection of the physical information about the property by personally uh, going in and looking at it simply because consumers are going to say, I, I don't know that I trust or that I want this uh, appraisal done on a desktop. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if you don't see a little pushback, you know, at that point on a declining market uh, where, where that, that might be a, a result of some of that. Uh, we do know right now that uh, there's a lot of increase in consumer debt and uh, you're starting to see a lot more of foreclosures on automobiles. And which is always kind of a leading indicator of things to come. And so, you know, when the market was going up dramatically, people could pull equity out and uh, satisfy some of this consumer debt. Uh, when prices are going down, it uh, creates the opposite effect. And if a homeowner is needing to have their values uh, at a certain level and the appraiser is saying, I'm sorry, it's just not there, uh, there there's a pretty good chance that people will file a complaint out of frustration and hopefully regulators have the good sense to uh, recognize them for what they are and not uh, and, and not uh, go after an appraiser on simply a, uh, a, a frivolous complaint, but uh, that, that has been known to happen before. As far as Arrow, I was unable to attend. I know a few people who did attend the Arrow conference and, you know, Arrow is the, uh, organization for regulating officials and I've been to the conferences in the past as a regulator and they've got some pretty good material you know trying to help investigators and others to try to find consistency uh, they have there have been matrices put together to try to encourage uh, consistency in uh, in enforcement the sad reality is there's no consistency whatsoever. Uh, you've got some states that uh, will hang you out to drive for a relatively modest you know, infraction and others that uh, won't do anything. 
and unless it's so blatant that you just can't avoid it. And unfortunately, in the current, uh, you know, the appraisal subcommittee has the responsibility to audit every state to make sure that they are, you know, they, they are the enforcement arm. The appraisal foundation doesn't have any ability to enforce the uh, qualification requirements established or the uh, standards uh, that, that, that are established. Uh, they, they simply establish the criteria and then the appraisal uh, subcommittee has the responsibility to monitor and make sure that this stuff is happening. Unfortunately, that monitoring doesn't involve very much. It's really kind of a very high level checklist and, and the biggest area of concern is making sure that uh, you're following qualification standards and that they're getting their complaints turned around inside of a year uh, to the extent possible. But beyond that, as far as actually doing an audit on the actual complaints and uh, whether the allegations of misconduct against the appraiser by the regulatory official uh, are, are, are reasonable, that, that simply doesn't happen right now. That's something we would like to see take place, but it's probably not going to happen in the, in the current environment because I don't, I, I think in some sense, the uh, subcommittee feels like they don't have the, the authority to, to, to do that. And so there, there's some debate about whether that should happen or not, but I don't think you're going to see a lot more uh, consistency in enforcement consistency until we get an appetite to try to require the uh, people meeting out the justice to have some accountability for the way it's done. So from the standpoint of uh, the uh, uh, the way the appraisal subcommittee works, the appraisal subcommittee comes up with its quote unquote rules and regulations, but uh, has no real enfor enforcement authority. These go down to the states. The states have appraisal statutes, which were instituted by the state legislature, of which USPAP is a part. And then the state appraisal board is the enforcement arm, uh, enforcing USPAP, enforcing uh, state statute. Uh, but um, from a standpoint of, uh, from a standpoint of f fairness or justice or even equity, I guess we can go that route. Um, what you're saying is an appraiser can engage in an action that in state A might result in a nasty letter and, you know, you, you didn't do anything wrong, don't do it again. Whereas in state B may mount an entire formal investigation, which might eventually end up in a full charge, which might eventually end up in a full sanction against the appraiser. And there isn't a, there isn't a uniformity, there isn't a standard. Uh, between the states, is Arrow in a position to do anything about that uh, inequity, or because it doesn't write use PAP and because it doesn't write state law, uh, is it not in a position to do anything about that inequity? You know, they're really not. Uh, they don't. It, it's simply a way for regulators to get together and compare notes, and they'll have speakers and get the latest update from the foundation and the subcommittee and all of that. Uh, but, but ultimately they, because every state has their own regulatory requirements, they're, they're, they're going to follow their own state law, which includes, as you mentioned, you know, use PAP and, and the qualifications, but the problem that, you know, as an appraiser, if I have an allegation made against me, uh, and there's some of these allegations become as you you know in in your in in your capacity as a consultant you've seen some of these allegations are kind of thin you know you you, you know the allegation is you produced a misleading report well what does that mean uh you know you if i spell a word wrong is that misleading or or if i use it in the wrong context is that misleading or you know there there's all of these kinds of things that you know, that, 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 that can be, if I want to reach far and long and far, I, I can, 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 can make a claim. And unfortunately, there's no real oversight to say, you know, regulator, you, this, this is a little bit of a stretch. Uh, 
you're not consistent with the other states in the way that you're meeting out the justice. And uh, so because that doesn't happen, it, 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 it's not. And, and then unfortunately, I think the the real pressure comes from uh, the the subcommittee is, are you getting your investigations closed within a year's time? And there's some times where it's just not practical to be able to do that. You know, you, you just run into too many uh, problems in, in making that happen. But that's really the metric that, uh, that that is being looked at is, are you getting these things done? And so on the on the one side, uh, I I may close cases sooner than I sh than I should to to look good for my audit, and on the other side, uh, I I uh, and, and I may be pressured into accepting a stipulation that uh, because they don't want to stretch it out long enough to go to a formal board hearing or something. So there's there's a lot of factors that play into that, uh, and I'm afraid that that. Uh, sometimes they don't benefit the profession as a result. Now, uh, Craig, uh, as we wrap this up, um, uh, I've, got, I've got to ask you this question. I have heard, and if, uh, I'm saying all I is I have heard, <clears throat> that at the Arrow meeting, somebody stood up, uh, somebody uh, with some clout stood up and said that uh, a pre a state appraisal boards uh, have to become more and more consumer oriented, thus by extension, less and less appraiser oriented. So while the deck is already stacked against us for various reasons, are we going to see a situation where the deck is even more stacked against us? Or because Arrow is, does not have a legislative capacity and does not have the ability to write use PAP, is that just somebody bloviating, uh, meaning it's not going to go anywhere. Well, I think nationwide, you know, th there, there are some issues and problems, you know, the, the, the allegations of racial bias and those claims, though, those are tricky. Uh, boards are having a hard time trying to deal with them. Uh, you know, is it, is it something that the board should be doing? Is this something that the CFPB is going to enforce? Is it something that HUD is going to enforce? Who's going to take action on these allegations? And one of the major takeaways from the PAVE task force who was looking at the appraisal uh, uh, profession was that uh, there's not a clear, if, if there are issues with an appraiser, most consumers have no idea how to appeal the appraisal. And, and unfortunately, as appraisers, we don't maybe do as good a job as we ought to uh, when we have a consumer call us and say, hey, I've got a question about your appraisal. And the appraiser says, you know what? I can't, you're not my client. I can't talk to you. And you hang up the phone. And I, I've had countless uh, calls from real estate agents who recount that very thing. And, and, and the problem is the poor buyer or borrower, they don't know what the, what, what, those regulations are. And, and unfortunately, as appraisers, if we had any sense, we would try to educate them, at least to the extent that you can, and say, you know, I would love to visit with you about this problem. But here's, here's, the, here's the issue for me, is that I am prohibited by law from communicating with anyone other than my client, which I'm sorry to tell you is your lender. So if you want to get something in writing from your lender, uh, giving me permission to discuss this with you, then I'd be happy to explain what I did or didn't do. And, uh, and, and the chances that the lender is going to give that permission are pretty low because the lender, the last thing they want is a violation of Dodd-Frank with undue influence allegations being made. And so it, it essentially deflects the issue from the appraiser to the lender that your, your client, the appraiser's client, and then they can decide if they want you to have that conversation or not. And, but, but we are not as kind and patient as we ought to be with people. And let's face it, none of us like having our work questioned or scrutinized, but, but uh, man, I'd rather have it done on the front end than have it done by the, the state board because I've got an unhappy consumer who thinks I screwed up and maybe I did. And uh, I get to deal with it in front of the board instead of uh, go in and make a few 
changes if, if necessary to try to resolve a concern or an issue, but there is not a clear path or method for this reconsideration of value. And uh, it looks like, you know, I, I, I can see that, uh, that there may be some, some fallout as a result of that, uh, where, where we might, where the consumer might have a little more ins uh, uh, pull on these things, even though they're not intended users of the appraisal. Craig, you and I have spoken in the past about the uh, a Representative Waters uh, bill. Uh, and one of its uh, precepts uh, was that it would make the borrower a de facto intended user. Now, that'll mean nothing to the borrower because the borrower doesn't have a clue what that means. But that will mean something to the appraiser because then it means the appraiser is not only responsible to the client, but as, a, as an intended user, as a named intended user, the appraiser will, will also be responsible to the borrower. Uh, and, and this is basically my last question because we're running out of time. But do you see uh, if that a part of her bill uh, goes forward, do you see that as uh, having a chilling effect on real estate appraisal or in the long run will appraisers just get used to it and manage the situation and move on? Well, I think we better pray it doesn't happen. Uh, there, there's a multitude of reasons why, that being one of them. The enforcement mechanism on the other is, is problematic to produce two years worth of uh, appraisal assignments under this bill. I mean, gee, what, what, a, what a pain in the neck that could become. But uh, I think the real, the real challenge is, is that lenders have a, established a protocol that meets their needs in being able to analyze the property for a loan. And because they are the intended user or the client and the GSEs may be an intended user, the way that we communicate those assignment results is based on that intended use for those intended users. When I open that up to be, you know, for a non-sophisticated property owner to now be an intended user and I have an obligation to write a report that my, uh, you know, this borrower who is now identified as an intended user can understand having these little quality and condition code ratings and all that stuff. The question becomes, well, how do I write my report that so it can be understood by someone who is a de facto intended user, but not really in terms of the purpose for the appraisal? And, and, and it becomes a sticky situation because what my lender understands with quality and condition ratings and codes for location and other things, uh, and, and the report itself, which is intended to be used in underwriting, uh, it doesn't, doesn't work so well for a typical non-sophisticated uh, property owner or borrower. And so the question is that, well, now am I going to have to expand and, and change the amount and the level of information that I have to put in the report uh, in, in order to meet that obligation to not mislead. That's obviously mm -hmm. an issue that uh, is, if, if, if a bill like this were to pass, that the appraisal uh, appraisers are going to have to deal with. But uh, at this stage of the game, it hasn't happened. And so, uh, you know, we, we can kind of continue uh, in the status quo and, and until such time that it does. But uh, it, it, it's certainly a uh, reason why we hope that a change in, 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 in the current direction of some of these uh, legislators uh, takes place because if some of the things these folks want to do happen, it's going to make life uh, a little more challenging for the appraisal profession. Yeah, it probably isn't going to help the consumer in the long run either. Probably well, not. Uh, uh, Craig, thank you. I, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your expertise. I uh, appreciate your passion for what you do and how much you care. Uh, Craig, if somebody wanted to get in touch with you and ask you some questions, uh, how could they do that? You can email me at valuepro at gmail.com. There's no E in value, so it's V-A-L-U-P-R-O at gmail.com. Or you can call my office at 435-673-7720 uh, and be happy to help anybody that uh, has an has inclination to, to need that.
Well, Craig, thank you. We appreciate it. So uh, we're going to thank Craig for his time and his expertise, and we're going to thank you for being here. We appreciate it very much. And we'll see you next time. This is Tim Anderson, the appraiser's advocate with Craig Morley, the value pro, and we're clear. <laughs>